This is QTV News. I am Maria Tusidibe and thanks for joining us. First, the main local, international and sports news headlines. President Adam Abaro will lay the foundation stone for the construction of the 86-kilometer North Bank Rural Roads Project at Sabach Sanjal and Kaur on Saturday. More than 2,000 Gambians fought in service of the British Empire during the Second World War. As the world observes Remembrance Day today, we bring you their present condition and bitter memories 75 years after the war ended. A day-long convergence to validate the national early warning strategy was organized on Wednesday by stakeholders. The UNFPA country representative has called for concerted efforts to tackle gender-based violence, which, he said, is anti-religion and inimical to the development of the people. In international news, today marks 45 years since Angola gains its independence from Portugal. And normally, an election taking place in a Southeast Asian country would hold little interest for many Gambians. However, in the case of Myanmar, we will bring you details of its weekend elections and why it matters to us. In sports news, the Gambia Scorpions had their first training session in Libreville ahead of their double-header Afghan qualifier first leg against Gabon. AFCON qualification resumed today across the continent, but not as we knew it as matches will be played behind closed doors due to COVID-19 health protocols by CAF. Now, the local news in detail. The presidency has announced that on Saturday, 14th November 2020, President Adam Abaro will lay the foundation stone for the construction of the 86-kilometer North Bank Rural Roads Project at Saban Sanjal and Kaur. QTV's Alusise takes a closer look at the importance of these roads. The road project is divided into two lots. Lot 1 is a 38-kilometer road linking Saba Sukuto to Bambali, Sarakunda to Ngen Sanjal, and is awarded to Araski Consultant Company Limited. Lot 2 is awarded to CSA Company covering Kau to Jimbala, Kau to Ker Ulde, and Kau Jane Kunda to the Senegal's border village of Ker Chendu, a total distance of 48 kilometers. According to the Ministry of Works, the project, which is estimated to cost $1.6 billion, is entirely funded by the Gambia government. The Ministry of Transport, Works and Infrastructure and the National Roads Authority are the executing implementing agencies. Pace Engineering, JV Gamex, is the consultant and the project is expected to last 16 months. The completion of the project is expected to improve the lives and livelihood of the people of these areas who for many years have limited poor road networks. Abdullah Samba of Sanjal Sarakunda welcomes the news of the construction of the road, saying the people of Sanjal have been yearning for such development while thanking the government for remembering them. <laughs> During the rainy season, vehicles that carry full stop from Farafenya do not come to Sanja Sarakunda because of the dilapidated road. The ambulance that also refers patients do encounter challenges on the road. Kadejalo, a native of the area, is joined by many who said, in addition to lack of safe drinking water and electricity, the poor road network has been a nightmare for them and therefore has slowed socio-economic activities in that area. As they keenly wait and prepare to welcome the president of the foundation stone laying, they are hoping the project will be completed on time. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sisse. More than 2,000 Gambians fought in the service of the British Empire during the war's bloodiest wars, including the Second World War. A very few of these war heroes are alive today, but for those few who are, they still carry with them the bitter memories of their war experience and present conditions 75 years after the war ended. As the world observes Remembrance Day this year, veterans and their families speak of neglect and abandonment by their former colonial masters. Remembrance Day is an annual ceremony observed all over for the fallen heroes of mankind's bloodiest conflicts. Some of them join in this celebration, but with less pride due to their present condition, having served in battles to liberate Europe from the atrocities of the Axis forces. They are with their families who spoke on their behalf. 
This remembrance celebrations is of no use to the veterans' families. It is God who protected my dad from the war because he could have even lost his life. The example I will give today is that my dad is attending the celebrations but did not even take breakfast. So, this remembrance is deceptive. More than half a million of African troops were conscripted by the British to bolster their war efforts with the Allied forces against the Axis forces. Hundreds of thousands of African soldiers lost their lives in the battlegrounds. And when the war ended in 1945, Britain launched demobilization efforts, returning surviving African troops back to the continent. The African soldiers came home to few employment opportunities, little social mobility, unpaid wages, and often with injuries for which they received poor medical care and rehabilitation. The few remaining Gambia's Second World War veterans who spoke to us narrated with bitterness how their expectations as war heroes have been dust after seven decades of neglect by the British. This is Ibu Janha, a Second World War veteran who lost his hearing, sustained injury to his stomach and one of his legs. All legacies from the battleground. Mr. Jaha continues to operate a workshop to support his family for survival. Mam Tuti is Ibu Jaha's daughter, and she explains her father's living condition, also calling for the intervention of the UK government. Someone who fought in the Second World War and has clocked over 100 years and is still going to work for a living. He is not truly remembered. They should be paid their dues now. And if they don't, they will pay for it hereafter. This is footage of Juma Sow, a Second World War veteran expressing his poor condition of living last year, recollecting his past experience after the war. After fighting in the war, we were paid a long amount of money after which I received nothing. Anything I get for survival now is from people's support. Jumasau died this year after battling illness on this QTV broadcast. He was shown seeking public financial support to cater for his medical bills. The Gambia Armed Forces held a state funeral to pay homage to the fallen hero. Last week, another veteran, Pateba, also passed away. The British government, in partnership with its Department for International Development and the Royal Commonwealth Ex Service League, have provided it with an £11.8 million for the World War II veterans and their widows in 29 Commonwealth countries. Only veterans and their widows are eligible for the aid. However, the transparency of the process has been questioned by the Veterans Families Association. Because we learned that even the funds that are coming, they are diverting it, they are giving it to people who have never participated in this war. Those who participated in the, in the war, few of them may benefit. But the majority of them who are benefiting has never participated in the Second World War. These corruption allegations have been directed to the Secretary General of the Gambia Legion over the payments of the grant and the entitlement of Gambian ex-servicemen. These war heroes lived and died for the liberation of Europe and today receive little recognition and care. But their legacy of giving their blood and sweat to liberate a people will last forever. They fought, died, or were wounded in the cause of freedom when their own countries were still under the colonial yoke. If we can give them nothing else, we at least owe them a solemn promise that on every Remembrance Day, we will remember their sacrifice and recall that it did not go in vain. Mohamed Lamin to TV News. A day-long convergence to validate the National Early Warning Strategy organized by the National Disaster Management Agency, supported by the FAO, took place on Wednesday. Jaina Basonko attended the event and she now reports. The preparation of the National Early Warning Strategy is part of a project by the FAO called Adapting Agriculture to Climate Change in the Gambia. Globally, millions of people have been killed by disasters caused by storms, droughts and floods. Some material losses seem to be unavoidable, especially those due to very large and infrequent events. In some cases, the loss of human lives could have been avoided if the proper precautions and measures had been put in place 
through the use of early warning systems. The validation is in line with Target G of the Sendai Framework, which advocates an increase in the number of countries that have multi-hazard early warning systems. The overall goal of this project is to support the Gambia's agriculture sector to become climate resilient by promoting urgent and immediate adaptation measures. Changes in the climate-related hazard will negatively affect a range of sectors, drought, floods, and increase in temperature, reduce the ability to grow crops, as well as affecting other aspects of the value chain. Example, drying, storage, and transport to market. According to the Food and Agricultural Organization, natural disasters and climate change will affect food security and disrupt food availability, access to food, as well as food quality. In 2019, Natural disasters fueled by climate change accounted for over $200 billion in losses globally and $15 billion in Africa. For the Gambia, we are here to support a successful early warning system that will enhance food security and nutrition, save lives and livelihoods, infrastructures, and make sure that there is long-term sustainability. People-centered early warning systems empower communities to prepare for and confront the power of natural hazards. However, the efficiency of such systems is to be measured in terms of lives saved and reduction in losses. In developing an early warning strategy, no single institution or agency can provide a fully comprehensive solution. It is therefore essential that all stakeholders work together to narrow knowledge gaps and to develop disaster risk strategy. A well-developed governance and institutional arrangements support a successful development and sustainability of sound early warning systems. Communities must also respect the warning service and know how to react to warnings. This requires systematic education and preparedness programs led by the National Disaster Management Agency. Reporting for QTV News, I am Jenna Bosonko. The UNFPA country representative has called for concerted efforts to tackle gender-based violence, which, he said, is anti-religion and inimical to the development of the people. The two-day training for religious leaders representing the Supreme Islamic Council and the Christian Council is organized by the Ministry of Women's Affairs in partnership with UNFPA under the UN Peace Building Project. It seeks to create a platform for dialogue for these faith-based organizations on issues of sexual and gender-based violence. Kunle Adenie, the UNFPA's country representative in the Gambia, describes gender-based violence as a menace posing so much injustice on women who are the most affected. Gender-based violence has various impact, implications, and consequences on a human being. And um, it also has legal implications on how we address it. But for me, I like to really focus on the impact it has on the cohesion and development of our society. Gender-based violence is inimical to the development of the people. Gender-based violence is anti-religion, it is criticized, discouraged by every religion that I know. He urges the participants to use the knowledge gain to raise public awareness on the prevalent cases of gender-based violence which is hardly talked about openly. We do not speak about gender-based violence for many reasons. It, it carries a lot of stigma. You know, it carries a lot of discrimination. It carries a lot of discouragement. It, there is no incentive, so to speak, for a girl or a woman that is abused to, you know, to speak out. Our Senghor of the Ministry of Women's Affairs hopes the training will be a milestone for future religious deliberations in the various religious gatherings. Since the um, beginning of this COVID-19 pandemic, cases of SGBV, are on the rise and in view of this 30 members has been nominated 
from both the Christian Council and Supreme Islamic Council to this two-day engagement workshop to build capacities of faith-based of these faith-based organizations to generate comprehensive resolution on sexual and gender-based violence. Haruna Baji of the Department of Social Welfare and Resource Passing for the Training says the participants will be exposed to the various concepts of gender, the impact of gender-based violence, and the existing gender-based violence-related laws in the Gambia. We expect them to uh, participate fully and also guide us through um, based on their experience as far as their religious teachings are concerned. Um, I think I'm not a religious, a religious scholar, I'm not an expert also in the Bible or the Quran, but I know uh, in all these two religions there is nowhere one can justify violence against another person. Uh, I believe obviously they will certainly cooperate with us and then try to uh, go through the process in a way that at the end of the day they will also go out and then, you know use their platforms to sensitize people on issues of gender-based violence. Studies on gender-based violence have shown that most of the survivors are women, while perpetrators are men. However, there are also reports of men who suffer gender-based violence. This training is expected to prepare these religious leaders with needed knowledge to guide them in their interaction with the public. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alu Sisi. We will go for a short commercial break and when we come back, the news continues with some more local news stories. Do stay tuned. Welcome back. Following a day-long consultation exercise, stakeholders in the horticulture sector on Wednesday reviewed and validated the commercial vegetable marketing in the Gambia Roadmap. And Sumana Isonyasi reports. Organized by Annabel, the Belgian agency, which has a branch in the Gambia, this day-long exercise has been applauded by stakeholders in the horticulture sector. The aim is to create an avenue for sharing of ideas among stakeholders and most importantly review and validate the recently developed roadmap for the promotion of commercial vegetable marketing in the Gambia, thus giving farmers direct benefits from farm proceeds. Following the validation of the draft document, Burang Danjo, project manager with the West Africa Rural Foundation, and Usman Bojang, the director of trade at the Ministry of Trade, Regional Integration and Employment, underscored the importance of such a progressive policy document that they say will financially empower horticulture farmers. The entire objective between, uh, behind bringing this idea upward by Enabel and us is just to ensure that our farmers are moved from where they are to another level. And they cannot be moved from where they are to another level until they have opportunities until they have uh, some, t some type of um, uh, mechanisms that can move them from where they are to another level. It is because of its centrality to the socio-economic development of the Gambia that the government, through the Ministry of Agriculture, continue to implement projects to improve the capacity and unleash opportunities in the subsector. The Ministry of Agriculture and other partners continue to provide support and improve infrastructure and production capacity of many women and smallholder gardens in various regions in the Gambia. Speaking earlier, Jimbe Sise, president of the Gambia National Vegetable Growers Association, and Mohamed Kebe, executive director of the West Africa Rural Institute, expressed optimism while calling on government and the private sector to provide more support for horticulture farmers, especially women gardeners. Mimu woti kana kole ya kuol nyininka, senela la tola kole ya kuol mumuneti. This is an important day for us. We appreciate that we are being asked what our problems are and how we think they can be addressed. It means we are being considered and we feel honored to take part in such an important process. We need to also acknowledge the consultative 
process. You know, at the end of the day, we end up having a product that has been co-developed uh, by all of the actors involved. This day-long exercise was facilitated by James Dean, intervention manager of the Rural Infrastructure Employment Project. Horticulture has always been an important direct source of rural income, employment and food. And despite holding high economic prospects, farmers in the sector say there are limited opportunities. However, it is hoped that the validation of this important roadmap will provide the required policy guidelines that will boost the sector. We will take another short break and we continue with international and sports news when we return. Welcome back. In international news, the Portuguese were the first European nation to have significantly made contact with Africa and they were the most reluctant to leave. Their colonies had fought bloody wars to gain independence. Angola finally achieved its independence in 1975. Today, they celebrate the 45th anniversary of that event. The Liberation War in Angola, known as Luta Armada de Libertação Nacional, the armed struggle for the national liberation, lasted just over 13 years, from February 1961 to April 1974. When independence finally came, the year after the overthrow of Portugal's authoritarian Estado Novo, it did not usher in an era of peace. Instead, the country saw a long and bloody civil war lasting 27 years, from 1975 to 2002, which witnessed a power struggle between two former anti-colonial guerrilla movements, the communist-leaning People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, backed by the Soviet Union and Cuba, and the Anti-Communist National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, backed by the United States. By the time the MPLA achieved victory in 2002, more than half a million people had died and over one million had been internally displaced. The war devastated Angola's infrastructure and severely damaged public administration, the economy and religious institutions. Today, the country's colonial history is reflected in its Portuguese-influenced cuisine, architecture and landmarks, including Fortaleza de São Miguel, a fortress built by the Portuguese in 1576 to defend the capital Luanda. The country is also dotted with thousands of examples of colonial architecture. Following independence, Antonio Augustino Neto was the first president of Angola from 1975 to 1979, having led the MPLA in the war for independence. His birthday is celebrated as National Heroes Day and is a public holiday in Angola. There's also a football stadium and a university named in his honour. On 22nd of March 2002, Jonas Savimbi, leader of UNITA, was killed in action against MPLA forces, effectively ending the civil war. UNITA and MPLA agreed a ceasefire shortly afterwards. As part of the deal, UNITA gave up its armed wing and has since assumed the role of a major opposition party. Current President João Lorenzo was the hand-picked successor to Eduardo dos Santos, who had been president for 38 years before stepping down in 2017. The current government estimates the Dos Santos family has robbed Angola of $24 billion. Today, Angola's capital Luanda is amongst the most expensive to live in anywhere in the world. Angola has diamonds, oil, gold, copper and a rich wildlife, forest and fossil fuels. Since independence, oil and diamonds have been the most important economic resource. And the country has become the fastest growing economy in Africa and one of the fastest growing in the world, with an average GDP growth of 20% between 2005 and 2017. From 2001 to 2010, Angola had the world's highest annual GDP growth rate of 11.1%. On this day, we wish them Feliz Gia de Independencia, or a very happy Independence Day. For QTV News, this is Ari Darami. 
A press release from Bahrain's royal court has announced the death of its long-serving prime minister, Prince Khalifa bin Salman al-Khalifa. More in this report. The press release states that Khalifa bin Salman al-Khalifa passed away today in a hospital in America where he had gone for treatment. The statement from the royal court added that Bahraini King Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa had declared a week of mourning, a lowering of the national flag and suspending work at government institutions for three days, starting from Thursday in mourning over the Prime Minister's death. The 84-year-old Prince Khalifa had been Prime Minister for 50 years, having assumed office on the 19th January 1970 making him the longest-serving prime minister of any government in the world. Under the 2002 constitution, he lost some of his powers, with the king now having the authority to appoint and, along with the Bahraini parliament, dismiss ministers. He was also the paternal uncle of the reigning king, Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa, and grand-uncle of the crown prince Salman, since he was the younger brother of the former emir, Isa bin Salman al-Khalifa. According to the Bahraini news agency BNA, his body will be flown home for burial in a funeral limited to a number of relatives. Prince Khalifa marries his cousin, Hesa bint Ali al-Khalifa, the fourth daughter of Ali bint Hamad al-Khalifa in Muharrab. They had three sons and one daughter. Bab Karsise, QTV News. Normally, an election taking place in a Southeast Asian country would hold little interest for many Gambians. However, in the case of Myanmar, Gambia's government would have been watching the weekend's electoral results with keen interest. More in this report. Having filed a still unresolved case at the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, against Myanmar for alleged genocide of the Rohingya Muslims, the Gambia government will have listened with dismay as the results emerge from Myanmar's weekend general election. The National League for Democracy, NLD, led by Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, and which won a landslide in 2015 election, seems to have done the impossible and bettered that showing. This is not good news for the Gambia's case against Myanmar as it seems the nationalist and xenophobic rhetoric and actions that led to the Rohingya being prosecuted are being endorsed and encouraged by the electorate. In some cases, it seems as the condemnation from much of the rest of the world has acted as rallying call for NLD supporters and even some who did not vote for them previously. Among the condemnations had been calls for Aung San Suu Kyi to be stripped of her Nobel Prize and in July, the British government issued a list of individuals against whom sanctions applied and included in that list Ming Ong Lin, the commander-in-chief of Myanmar's armed forces and his deputy for their alleged involvement in the systematic and brutal violence against the Rohingya people and other ethnic minorities. Throughout the election campaign, the personality cult, which had grown up around Suu Kyi during her years of exile and on her return, appears to have grown even stronger. All the election rallies and the scenes of jubilant post-election celebrations featured her image more than any other. During the elections, there were stories of Rohingya candidates and parties not being allowed to register on the grounds their parents or grandparents were not born in Myanmar. The Rohingya will have listened to these election results with increased dread. Bab Karsise, QTV News. In sports news, the Gambia Scorpions had their first training session in Libreville on Tuesday ahead of their doubleheader Afghan qualifier first leg against the Panthers of Gabon on Thursday. Despite missing some key players, coach Tom Sanfair says he is confident. For any team to get a good result in a match, confidence and high spirits are key. This seems to be in the Scorpions camp in Libreville, spearheaded by coach Tom Sanfair. In an interview with the GFF's communication officer, Bakari Balde, Sanfair renewed his confidence in his players ahead of the Thursday class with Gabon.
The last two and a half years we all together built the confidence. I mean, uh, two and a half years ago it was five years that we were waiting for a competitive victory. And uh, we, we won against Benin, we won in Angola the first away victory in over 40 years time. Uh, we won friendlies against Congo, Morocco, Guinea, we drew, drew twice against Algeria. That's the confidence the players deserve to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it doesn't matter which players are available, uh, with different teams, with different uh, group of players, we achieved always good results. Although the coach shows optimism, he was cautious saying he is facing a very good Gabon side led by Per Emrick Aubameyang in a talk. The Gabon and Arsenal star missed two of Patry's nervous training sessions. He is expected to join his teammates on Thursday as the team travelled to Franceville for the match. On the other side, uh, even if we miss a lot of uh, important players, mm -hmm. we have still a lot of quality players who are ready, who are very eager. Yeah. Uh, people sometimes underestimate the role of motivation, mm -hmm. the role of happiness and the role of desire to play for the country. Mm -hmm. The quality is, is important, but not all. Uh, it's the fighting spirit. And if you want to get a good result, mm -hmm. it will be a team performance with a great fighting spirit what can guide us to a good result on Thursday. Gambia and Gabon go into this game on four points each, with the Scorpions leading the group on goal difference. A win for either side will see them top the standings, while a draw might change the maths, depending on the result of the game between Angola and DR Congo. Coach Tom says he wants to win the game to maintain his lead in the group. To be honest, I start every play with the, every game with the ambition to, to win. I know it's not realistic to win every game. There is no coach in the world to win every game. But when we start a game, we have a game plan. What has to help us to guide to a victory? Uh, but we know we play against a strong opponent. Uh, we will see after the game if the victory was realistic or if we have to be satisfied with the draw. For Gabon's coach, Patrick Nervo, he already has most of his players, except for star man Per Emerick Aubameyang, Dennis Buanga, Kanga Julo, Bupeza and Otuju. The two teams will have their final warm-up sessions at the start, the Franceville, before they face each other on match day three on Thursday evening. Mumudu Gajaga, QTV News. Afghan qualification resumed today across the continent, but not as we knew it. Matches will be played behind closed doors due to COVID-19 health protocol by CAF. But how would these guidelines impact on matches? Our reporter Mumudu Gajaga takes a look. The Gambia Scorpions have been hit hard with about four players denied permission by their clubs to travel for national team duty. Police side Gonik Zabzi have said that Alassane Amane will not be allowed to join up with his Scorpion teammates. Roma's reserve team player Ibrahim Odabo has also been denied permission. Two other players, Noha Marong of Granada and Suleiman Bojang of Sparsborg, were also denied, leaving Thompson fit to make swift adjustments to his squad before facing Gabon in Group D. In normal circumstances, football clubs around the globe are required by FIFA regulations to release their players for national team duty, even if that player is injured. In the past, Clubs and national associations have reached agreements over the availability of specific players for certain matches. However, if there is no such resolution, players can end up being banned for playing for their clubs in some of the games after the international break. Concerns caused by the ongoing global coronavirus pandemic has led to some clubs being reluctant to allow their players to travel. In reaction to the new guidelines, Guinea's coach Didier Shees has questioned the FIFA rule that allows clubs not to release players because of the coronavirus, ahead of his team's double head against Chad in the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers. FIFA gave the clubs the possibility of saying no. I would have liked that when we send the call-ups to the clubs, FIFA gave the clubs 24 to 48 hours to reply. FIFA asked us to submit the list of 23 players who are going to participate 15 days in advance. Put yourself in the place of a coach who doesn't know until the last minute if his players will come or not, he said in an interview.
Initially, all matches are meant to be played behind closed doors. But CAF's most recent ruling on whether fans can go to matches was that, according to CAF's COVID-19 protocol, all matches must be played behind closed doors without spectators. However, if the government of the host association wants spectators to be present, then the association in question will need to obtain CAF's approval. Nations that have managed to get the go-ahead to allow fans are Tanzania, whose Benjamin Kapa National Stadium in Dar es Salaam will be at 50% capacity for the visit of Tunisia in Group J, and Mauritania, who have been given approval to allow a handful of fans for their home leg tie against Burundi on Wednesday. Nigeria had hoped to allow fans in to see their qualifier against Sierra Leone in Benin City, but that idea has since been rejected. Mudu Gajaga, QTV News. And in the early games played today on the resumption of Afghan matches, Guinea won 1 0 against Chad. Kenya drew one all with Comoros and Mauritania drew one all with Burundi. And in the final early match, Senegal triumphed 2 0 over neighbors Guinea Bissau. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. President Adam Abaro will lay the foundation stone for the construction of the 86-kilometer North Bank Rural Roads Project at Sabach Sanjal and Kaur on Saturday. More than 2,000 Gambians fought in the service of the British Empire during the Second World War. As the World Observes Remembrance Day, we bring you their present condition and bitter memory 75 years after the war ended. A day-long convergence to validate the national early warning strategy was organized on Wednesday by stakeholders. The UNFPA country representative has called for concerted efforts to tackle gender-based violence, which he said is anti-religion and inimical to the development of the people. In international news, today marks 45 years since Angola gained its independence from Portugal. And normally, an election taking place in a Southeast Asian country would hold little interest for many Gambians. However, in the case of Myanmar, we brought you details of its weekend elections and why they matter to the Gambia. In sports news, the Gambia Scorpions had their first training session in Libreville ahead of their doubleheader Afghan qualifier first leg against Gabon. Afghan qualification resumed today across the continent and most matches will be played behind closed doors due to COVID-19 health protocol issued by CAF. That's all we have for you in this edition of the news. Join us at 10 for another bulletin. Thank you for watching.